Hi guys, today I'm going to be talking about how to run a RAG app in a browser. Now, this is an area of interest of mine that I've been trying to do for a while, just as a curiosity to see if it was even practical. And it's not very practical, but it is an interesting experiment. And I think as the technology emerges and evolves, it might actually become viable at some point in the future. But in any case, I just want to look at kind of the architecture of a RAG app and then kind of how you would go about looking at this in the browser using some of the tools that are available for running AI in a browser context. So let's just go over, review the architecture for what a RAG app involves, and then we'll go look at the implementation that I have. And then I'll uh, talk about it, some of the pros and cons of doing it this way and why you probably don't want to do this in a browser anyway, but talk about it in the more general sense of where you would actually use a RAG app and the kind of context you would run that in. So let's talk about RAG architecture. RAG architecture really is about bringing data together with the generative capabilities of an LLM. So we're going to start with some kind of data source. Data sources are typically going to be some kind of text documents. It doesn't have to be text, but it's going to be something that we want to search. And it's going to be in some kind of form that we have access to. So it could be like a wiki, it could be a collection of documents on a drive or in a document repository. We're just basically going to use whatever documents we have and extract the data from those to search. So the, to do that, we're first going to land the data. And by this, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be basically either creating a copy of that data in its raw form or at least having a reference to it, because that's going to be important later in this chain that we have here. So once we have that data landed or at least have a reference to it, we're going to take that raw data and we're going to extract the semantic content. Now, the semantic content is basically anything that is related to the actual meaning or the knowledge that's baked into our, the data source. So if this is dealing with something like Word documents or web pages, it's going to remove things that control formatting or, or layouts and things on the screen that are relevant to that context, but don't really add any kind of knowledge that would be useful for searching for that kind of data. So we basically just focus on the pure text of uh, text documents and that and the like. So once we've extracted the semantic content, we're going to create embeddings. Now, creating an embedding is a multi-step process. Basically, what you have is the original document. And you take that document and you chunk it up into smaller bite-sized pieces. Now, it might be a small document so that you don't have to do that. So you can just keep it as is. But typically, if it's a large document, you want to chunk that up into smaller sections so that we can create a tokenization of that particular block of text. Now, tokenization is basically just a bunch of numbers that represent what's inside of that text. So you take it and you assign a number to either a character or word or something like that. And that is something that the model, the embedding model will understand. So you take that, that tokenization representation of that text and you pass that into the embedding model. Now, the embedding model is trained on other text data and it's designed to be able to associate the numbers that you're passing in in your your tokenization with other similar ideas that are kind of embedded in the model and so when you pass in that tokenization it's going to pass it through the embedding model and it's going to spit out some different numbers which is what we call an embedding and that embedding represents the semantic context of whatever it is that you passed in. When I say semantic context, I'm talking about the ideas that are inside of whatever you're passing into the embedding model. So if you're talking about dogs on a leash in the backyard, it's going to have some kind of reference pointing to dogs you know, leashes and backyards and, and where those intersect. And so that becomes semantically rich because of those ideas. And then what you do is you take that embedding and you store it somewhere. And that's where we have the idea of a vector database. That embedding is a, a, another word for a vector. And a vector is just basically a set of coordinates in a multi-dimensional space. So if you can think of it like a three-dimensional space, you have X, Y, and Z, but vector databases can store more than three dimensions. We can have hundreds or even thousands of dimensions depending on the complexity of our model and so on. So once we've stored everything in the vector database, we're, we're kind of done with the data ingestion side of it. Now we need to search this. So and this is where the actual app part of a RAG app comes into play. So with a RAG app, we're going to have um, the client and the client in most cases is going to be like a phone or a tablet or a PC and it's going to have a human interacting with that and they're going to be you know, searching uh, against this vector database. And to do that, the first thing that they're going to do is interact with some kind of orchestration. Now, typically this is an API, but because we're going to be doing this in a browser, everything is self-contained. 
within the browser context. So I, I'm just calling it orchestration here. Now the user will type in usually a prompt, uh, usually a question or some kind of instruction that it wants to use to instruct the model to do. Like find me something about dinosaurs or find me something about dogs on leashes or whatever the subject might be. Typically the user is gonna be at least aware of what kind of data they're looking at. So they're gonna type in questions related to whatever topic or knowledge is baked into the system that I'm designing here. And so once they type that in, it's going to do basically what it did when it created the embeddings. It's going to create an embedding for whatever the prompt that was entered. Now the prompt could be amended by something in the orchestration layer uh, that enriches that prompt. So it might take that prompt and have a system prompt that combines it with the user's inner prompt and then creates an embedding from that. So that just creates a richer uh, embedding. It doesn't have to, but that's typically how these work. And then it gets the embedding back from the embedding model. And then it uses that to search the vector database. Now searching the vector database means that it's basically going to go into the vector database and do some kind of matching against the data that we stored when we created all the embeddings from the source data. And it's going to attempt to find the closest matches it can based on any number of different matching schemes. Typically cosine similarity is the one that most text oriented rag apps use. And then once it finds matches, it's then going to take that and pass it into an LLM or a generative model. So this would be like GPT-3.5 or GPT-4. And then it's going to attempt to analyze that data based on the prompt that you entered. So it might change the prompt that you entered with another, a new system prompt, and that will then uh, process the data. Maybe it's summarizing it. Maybe it's answering a question. It's doing something like that. And then from there, it's going to take that response uh, out of the LLM and then pass it back to the client. And the client will then be able to see the results on the screen. So this represents kind of soup to nuts, everything that goes into making a RAG app possible. So there's a lot of details in each one of these steps. I'm not going to belabor all these, but we're going to see this basically represented in the code that I'm going to show you, uh, at least at a high level, because it's kind of glossing over a lot of the, the, the details that you would have whenever you're going through this process with a more rich RAG app than what I'm going to show you, because basically what I'm going to be showing you in the browser is, is more of a proof of concept than a fully functional application. But it does show you that it is possible, although I don't think it's very practical. So let's just go look at the code and then we'll uh, judge based on what you see in that code if you think this is a good idea or a bad one. So here's my code. It's pretty straightforward. I have HTML, CSS and JavaScript all in one file. All said and done, it's only about 126 lines of code, and a lot of that is HTML and CSS. So the actual meat and, potato of this, meat and potatoes of this is JavaScript, and that's pretty straightforward. I do have this other file here, this index.js, and it's just serving up static content. It's not doing anything, so no smoke and mirrors here, other than serving up static content, which happens to be a single file, index.js. I needed that to do dev work. So we can kind of gloss over the first uh, 30 or so lines of this because the real interesting code starts around line 32 with transformers.js. Now transformers is a library that came out of the Python world that was put out by Hugging Face. And the idea behind transformers was to provide an API on top of all these different models. Hugging Face is a online repository for AI models. I like to think of it as the GitHub of AI because it has, I think, over a million models now. And these models are for a variety of different tasks. They could be uh, image uh, processing, so like computer vision things or speech to text for audio processing. It could be uh, text generation or multimodal AI. There's a lot of different things that they can do with the various kinds of tasks that you can do with AI. And if you've ever worked with a model directly, it can be rather arduous to get that model loaded into a particular context and then get it configured correctly so that it'll actually behave the way that you want it to. If you've ever done that, it's very tedious and very time consuming. So to kind of help mitigate that problem, uh, Hugging Face created uh, transformers.js as a standard way of getting models into a, a particular context, be it, be it in JavaScript for transformers.js or transformers for Python. And what the model developers will do is provide some meta files. 
And those meta files will then configure transformers.js and also point to the actual model files, which are large binary files or large uh, text files, depending on how you're loading them. And then the actual libraries will download those models for you. And those will work in whatever context that you're using. So in our case with transformers.js, what I'm going to wire up is a model on Hugging Face by pointing to the repo. And by using the repo right here, Hugging Face will then reach out and grab the meta files, download those and configure transformers.js. And then it will download the actual model itself, which can be small or large, depending on the model. And then it will have it all up and ready to go, but it will expose it through a consistent API, which is what the this pipeline idea uh, is for. And the, so if I tell it, I want to create a feature extraction pipeline, the API for feature extractions will look similar for all of my feature extraction models that are hosted on Hugging Face or text generation models like this one right here. If I'm going to be using text generation, all of the models basically follow the same kind of API that I would use. So in this case, I'm using two different pipelines. I'm using feature extraction for embeddings. I'm using text generation for my LLM component. Now, the models I chose for this are not ones that I'm like particularly fond of or for any other reason than they just seem to be the ones that I was able to get work uh, fairly well in uh, this context that I'm using here. So I'm using mixed bread AI. Uh, I'm using a BERT based uh, model from this particular um, repo right here. And it's a fairly large model and it does a fairly good job of embedding some, some larger corpuses of text. And then for the LLM, I'm using Llama from Facebook, which is uh, a robust uh, tried and true model. It's been out for a few years now and it's been production ready for a while. So a lot of different apps will use Llama because it's very reliable and consistent and it's been adapted to a number of different use cases. So it's a very reliable model that folks have been uh, using for a number of years. However, there are some uh, newer models that are coming out that are interesting. Uh, one like five from Microsoft, 535, which seems to be able to handle larger uh, bodies of text. So it has better, and it's also very fast. So it's able to generate uh, text uh, fairly quickly, even with large uh, sets of text. And it has promise, but I couldn't get it to work consistently. So I went back to the more tried and true default, in this case, Llama. So uh, with these two models, I'm going to be extracting in uh, from the text embeddings, and I'm going to be using those for uh, using this one for embeddings, and then using this one to analyze the text. So I'm going to be basically storing all of that data in an array, which is basically my vector database. So I'm not going to be using a vector database per se, but I am going to be using some kind of data storage mechanism, which is an end memory array for storing both the chunks of data that I'm going to be using as well as their associated embeddings. And that's, that's important, which we'll see in a minute. So, uh, that's kind of all the ceremony to bootstrap everything I need. Next is going to be doing the extraction process. That's creating the embeddings. And so I have on the UI, a basically a text block where I can paste in some text and then I click generate embeddings. And that then will then take the actual large body of text that I paste into that text box and then chunk it up into one kilobyte chunks. And then it stores those. Um, and those chunks are just 100, 1K each. There are better ways of chunking than this. This is just a kind of a crude way to do it. I'm not getting into chunking uh, here in this video, but uh, if I was going to be writing a more production oriented app, I would probably use a better chunking strategy, like looking for uh, more semantic breaks, like headings or paragraphs or, or sentences, whatever it is I might be looking for. And there, there's libraries that can do that kind of thing. But for this one, I just wanted something that, hey, I'm just going to chunk it into one kilobyte chunks. It's probably good enough for what I'm trying to do here. And so I'm going to store that uh, in the chunks for now. And then I'm looping over the chunks right here to get embeddings. I'm calling that extractor, which is that uh, feature extraction pipeline, which is getting back embeddings as my output. And then I'm pushing the original chunk from the original data uh, alongside its embedding onto this result right here. So it's just getting the chunk of text, creating an embedding, putting the two together and putting that into an array. Pretty simple right there. And so I get one object per chunk that I create an embedding for. And so I have the original associated with the embedding. And that's important because what happens next, which is uh, our search down here. So once I have the results, I store those in that stored chunk array and that becomes my vector database in memory. 
And I do display this just so that you can kind of see what's going on behind the scenes there. So the next part of the RAG app is, if you remember back from the diagram, it's kind of the right side of that where I have a, a client that's going to be interacting with this. In this case, I'm basically searching this. So I'm going to allow the user to enter a prompt and I search this corpus of text, answer a question, whatever it might be. I'm going to put something into that. And then I'm going to grab that uh, from that text box. And then I'm going to create an embedding for it, just like I did uh, or for the embeddings. And then I'm going to call a similarity a search. So the, the similarities as, is going to uh, try to map onto this uh, store chunks right here. And it's, it's going to uh, basically figure out what thing in my store chunks is most similar to what I typed into the prompt. And that's doing that by a, by way of this helper function right here, this um, cosine similarity. So it's, it's, a, it's going to pass in both the, the query embedding, which is the one from what I typed in and the embedding that I got from the original chunk data. And that's just a doing basically a dot product across those. I'm not going to get into the math that's behind all that, but what it's going to return is a, a number. And the closer that number is to one, the more similar it is uh, to what I am interested in. And so in theory, it should give me something that is more relevant than uh, the other things in my uh, various chunks that I have. So I'm basically going to get the top three chunks and just put those out there. I'm going to display those, whatever those might be. And that's what I'm interested in. And then from there, um, I am going to then create a prompt. My prompt here is going to be used for my generation model. So the prompt that I'm doing here is uh, both a system prompt and a user prompt. And my system prompt is you're a research assistant, answer the question, and I'm passing in the original prompt that the user did. And then I'm giving it the most similar chunk, which is should be the one that's most similar to what I typed in my query. And then I say, answer the question that I entered. And then it's going to then create this the these messages and then pass those into my generator. And then this is going to call the LLM and then it's going to process that. And then it's going to have some kind of output. And then the output is just going to be displayed on the screen as output right here. It's going to show you basically, oh, here, here's the answer to your question or here's what I, you asked for. It's going to attempt to interpret whatever's in that query based on whatever's in the model. So all that to say is this is um, the entire app uh, beginning to end. And here's some helper functions down here. But you see both the ingestion of data and then also the searching in that data and the use of similarity searches to bring those two together. So let's go over to the browser and take a look at this in action. So here is the app running in the browser. You can see here I'm going to be pasting in my text. And I'm going to click generate embeddings and those will be displayed below the button. And then I'm going to enter my prompt here and then I'm going to hit search. And then it should show me the output from that search down here below it. And I am um, have the debug window open so you can kind of see what's happening behind the scenes. I've already loaded this up. And so the models for me are already cached. So if this is your first time running this, it can take a while to load because behind the scenes, it's going to be downloading a model. And this is fairly large. So it, this could be multiple gigabytes in size. So you want to make sure that you, know, you use the cached version. So that's one reason this is not going to be very practical for just general web consumption because these models are rather large. And that's not really what you want to be doing when you're developing a web app where you have to download two or three gigs worth of models just to make it create some embeddings and search it. I would say, okay, I'm going to draw the line here and you're going to call an API. Um, so the the text I'm going to be using is just basically a Wikipedia or Wikipedia article about ty uh, Tyrannosaurus rexes. And so I already removed all the formatting from it. And so I'm gonna basically uh, copy and paste some data into this corpus of text here. And then I'm gonna create generate embeddings and let that run, which will take uh, a few minutes to do because that's a fairly computationally complex process. And so I'm gonna click generate embeddings, I'm gonna let it run, and then I'll come back when it's done. And we we'll, should see results on the screen. So the embeddings are done. You can see that I have those displayed here. So here's my chunk, which is just the, the bits of text that it created uh, the embedding from. So it's just a string and each chunk is a kilobyte in size. And this is the embedding, which is 128 uh, 
different dimensions. So each dimension represents a various aspect of the semantic data that's embedded in that. And so this has got 128 dimensions at one level deep. So it's a fairly, it's just a flat array. And so I did that for each one of these uh, chunks that I created. So I have, I don't know, maybe 10 or so, so chunks here. So I'm going to type in a question and I'm going to let this run. Let's see if I can get a good question from my source data. I'm going to say, uh, how long ago did the uh, T-Rex uh, live? Can you, can you j provide an estimate? And then I'm going to click search. And it's going to do a similarity search and it's showing that this one right here is the most similar. And this is what it's producing right here to estimate. Let's analyze the information provided. The T-Rex lived from 68 to 66 million years ago. Age range is the Jurassic period uh, during which dinosaurs was present. Um, uh, estimated from that time, we can, we can approximate it lived about 65 to 61 million years ago. Um, and this one right here is some kind of random piece of information that just kind of attacked on there. So it did work fairly well. So we can see that it is able to answer my questions and it did get that from, uh, you know, whatever this is right here, uh, this, this data. So I could ask it another question. Let's see how tall was the T-Rex? Um, was it a big dinosaur? Um, providing questions like this, uh, gives it context so that it can do better searching. So that's just part of prompt engineering. If I just ask it how tall it was, it could may or may not work, but having you know, some other context to talk about size will generally help me get better results. And let's see if this helped. Um, looks like it got a fairly, you know, some measurements there. Let's see. Question is about the T-Rex uh, estimated between 3.7 to 4 meters or 12 to 13 feet high based on the fossil records of the specimen. So it is working. You can kind of see that it is working, but let's go through and then talk about this from just a practical perspective now, because uh, I wanted to look at this knowing that it does work, but also look at it from another angle, which is just the uh, practicality of doing something like this. So here is the app running in the browser. You can see here, I'm going to be pasting in my text and I'm going to click generate embeddings and those will be displayed below the button. And then I'm going to enter my prompt here and then I'm going to hit search. And then it should show me the uh, output from that search down here below it. And um, I have the debug window open so you can kind of see what's happening behind the scenes. I've already loaded this up. And so the models for me are already cached. So if this is your first time running this, it can take a while to load because behind the scenes, it's going to be downloading a model. And this is fairly large. So it, this could be multiple gigabytes in size. So you want to make sure that you, know, you use the cached version. So that's one reason this is not going to be very practical for just general web consumption because these models are rather large. And that's not really what you want to be doing when you're developing a web app where you have to download two or three gigs worth of models just to make it create some embeddings and search it. I would say, okay, I'm going to draw the line here and you're going to call an API. Um, so the, the text I'm going to be using is just basically a Wikipedia or Wikipedia article about ty uh, Tyrannosaurus rexes. And so I already removed all the formatting from it. And so I'm going to basically uh, copy and paste some data into this corpus of text here. And then I'm going to create generate embeddings and let that run which will take uh, a few minutes to do because that's a fairly computationally complex process. And so I'm going to click generate embeddings. I'm going to let it run and then I'll come back when it's done and we we'll, should see results on the screen. If you like this content, please consider subscribing to the channel by clicking on the subscribe button. You can also like this content by clicking on the thumbs up or share this content with your friends and also comment in the comment section down below. You can also find me online at www.blaze.net or on Twitter at The One Mule. And as always, thanks for watching.